What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Illumination Hour. It's me, Ellen. I'm back, and I'm alive. Can you believe it? Oh my goodness, I cannot tell you how hard it has been for me to get back in this chair and record with you, because I had to take a sick week last week, unfortunately, and I really didn't want to, but there is a good reason why I did. And I think you'll appreciate it once you find out why. Um, I had this this horrible illness fall upon me, and it lasted only about a week, luckily. But, oh man, it was just debilitating how sick I became. I mean, the first few days it was sore throat, runny nose, and then it turned into a fever where I was just delirious, and I couldn't do anything but sleep for two days. Luckily, I have a wonderful person that I live with that was capable enough to take care of me, and I really sincerely appreciated that. I don't think I would have made it through those two days if it hadn't have been for my wonderful partner. So thank you so much to him, and I'm excited to say that I've made a full recovery. Uh, Almost. There's still a few symptoms, but um, I have to say, after going through something so horrible and unpleasant, I've come out of it with a much greater appreciation for the way that I feel on a daily basis. You don't really understand until it's taken away from you, but, like, I have so much energy throughout every single day. Uh, Like, I wake up in the morning, and I have thoughts that go through my head, like, I need to do this, I need to do that. Wow, it's pretty outside today. I like the sunrise. Oh, hi, there's my dog and my cat. I'm so excited to see them. I'm excited to, you know, go out and face the world. But when that's taken away from you, and all you can feel is this inner world of of pain and anguish and and uh unpleasantries it really puts into perspective how much you've lost and it's also interesting because being in that world of pain it really makes you realize how much of your daily experience is determined just by what's going on in your own body i mean I can function normally with a stomach ache, but it does take my attention away from more important things. I mean, not so much that I can't actually focus or function, but it affects my mood. It makes me feel less happy or less satisfied with my life. And going through something even worse than that, it's it's more than unsatisfying. It's more like uh, I would rather die than be going through this misery. I exist now only as a bundle of pain and anger and horrible feelings. And nobody wants to live like that. I certainly did not want to. But after having gone through it, of course, I now really am more happy, I think, than I was before. Just because I realize that I do have a lot of energy and I do have a lot of nice, pleasant experiences in my life that I enjoy and I want to keep having again and again. And there are a lot of new things that I want to try and go out and do. And I have the motivation to do that and I have the will to do it. And I have the brain power to think about things that happen like that. But going through that whole experience made me think, made me wonder, you know, because 
I know I'm not the only person that has gone through something painful or unpleasant. And I'm sure there are people that have gone through things that are a million times worse than that. Or maybe they are still or they do every day. But what is life like for them? You know, do they appreciate the pleasant aspects of life as much as I do now that I've been through that? Also, there are people that live with chronic pain or illness. They probably have a completely different psychology than somebody who is a normal healthy person that has a bad experience like you know hitting their head or coming down with a horrible illness or hurting themselves and then i started thinking you know there are different kinds of people that i've come across there are those who will avoid pain at all costs anything that's unpleasant they will do whatever it takes to avoid it it doesn't matter if there's something beneficial that might come out of it at the end, which is, you know, a special circumstance, but it does happen. Um, you know, going through something difficult, it can sometimes be painful or grueling or just not a pleasant experience. And, you know, there are people who who will go to the ends of the earth to avoid that. But then there are people who willingly go into those situations where they know that they're going to be facing things that are difficult to to handle or unpleasant to feel and they're okay with it they've accepted that they have to do it or it's just going to happen you know and then there are people who kind of thrive on pain uh it's like a i don't know if i want to say obsession or fetish but it's Something that on some level they kind of enjoy, or at least they've normalized, so that they feel like they're familiar with being in pain, and it's normal for them. So they kind of seek it out subconsciously. And I thought that was very interesting. And so this episode, I want to explore those dynamics, uh, talk a little bit about pain and what it is how we respond to it as people as compared to how, say, animals respond to it and what it can mean for us, you know, because it does accomplish some things sometimes, even if it's not leading us to any sort of outcome, it does give us an experience and, and how do we process that experience? So that. I guess, is the intro and uh, the whole reason why I want to talk about pain today and where we're going to be going with it. So I think to start this conversation, we need to have a functional definition of what pain is, although it's almost kind of impossible because pain is such a subjective and various sort of feeling that it's hard to define precisely. But we can give it kind of an umbrella term. So pain can be a a distressing feeling caused by damaging or intense things that happen to us, but it can also be a distressing feeling or emotion. It can be defined by the region of the body that is involved in it, uh, the system or the duration and pattern, the intensity, there are all different ways to feel pain. Sometimes pain is just involved physically with your body, as in, you know, you stub your toe, or you slam your finger in the door. We all know how painful that is, and it really hurts. You know, we try to avoid those experiences all the time. People who often hurt themselves in that way are called clumsy and nobody wants to be clumsy not just because it's a social faux pas but because it's unpleasant for us you know it's a feeling that we try to avoid but there are also psychological aspects to pain it's not just the physical ouch that hurts it does affect our mentality and it does so in ways that sometimes we don't recognize Sometimes the pain that's affecting us is completely psychological. 
In which case, I think that is the most damaging sort of pain. I mean, when we feel pain, it's our body's way of telling us, this is hurting me, stop it, get away from whatever is causing the pain. And that's why people dislike it, because we have developed and evolved in a way that has taught us to avoid certain things and to go after the things that give us pleasure, which is basically the opposite of pain. And sometimes that's a good thing. We have the pain response for a reason. If the pain is too intense, it may be because we're going through an experience that is actually life-threatening, or it could seriously damage our ability to function. So pain does serve a good purpose for each and every one of us. But the psychological pain that we go through is often not something that serves to benefit us. If anything, it's something that we should try to get over or avoid because psychological pain doesn't help us avoid anything that's damaging us. Usually it's in response to something that has damaged us already and it's our brain's way of responding to that event. And if this psychological pain goes on for too long, sometimes it can lead to other negative side effects. I have an article here from Harvard Health Publications about pain, anxiety, and depression, and how interrelated they are. Everyone experiences pain at some point, but in people with depression or anxiety, pain can become particularly intense and hard to treat. People suffering from depression, for example, tend to experience more severe and long-lasting pain than other people. The overlap of anxiety, depression, and pain is particularly evident in chronic and sometimes disabling pain syndromes such as fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, lower back pain, headaches, and nerve pain. For example, about two-thirds of patients with irritable bowel syndrome who are referred for follow-up care have symptoms of psychological distress, most often anxiety. Well, yeah, I'd think I'd have anxiety too if I had irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, and yeah, headaches for me are really debilitating. Like if any other part of my body is in pain, I can function normally and still maintain a somewhat decent mood, but if my head is in pain, that's where all of my thoughts and feelings come from. You know, if that's suffering, then my whole being suffers. So I really have sympathy for people who go through horrible headaches and migraines like that. But yeah, nerve pain and back pain also could be very intense and debilitating. Anyway, back to the article. About 65% of patients seeking help for depression also report at least one type of pain symptom. Psychiatric disorders not only contribute to pain intensity, but also to increased risk of disability. Researchers once thought that the reciprocal relationship between pain, anxiety, and depression resulted mainly from psychological rather than biological factors. Chronic pain is depressing. And likewise, major depression may feel physically painful. But as researchers have learned more about how the brain works and how the nervous system interacts with other parts of the body, they've discovered that pain shares some biological mechanisms with anxiety and depression. Shared anatomy contributes to some of this interplay. The somatosensory cortex, which is the part of the brain that interprets sensations such as touch, interacts with the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the anterior cingulate gyrus. And these are all areas that regulate emotions and the stress response to generate the mental and physical experience of pain. These same regions also contribute to anxiety and depression. So it's more than just a psychological connection between physical pain and mental pain. There's actually a biological reason that they're interrelated. In addition, two neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine, contribute to pain signaling in the brain and nervous system. They're also implicated in both anxiety and depression. 
Treatment is challenging when pain overlaps with anxiety or depression. Focus on pain can mask both the clinician's and the patient's awareness that psychiatric disorders are present. Even when both types of problems are correctly diagnosed, they can be difficult to treat. A review identified a number of treatment options available when pain occurs in conjunction with anxiety or depression. So here are some key points. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, is not only an established treatment for anxiety and depression, it's also the best studied psychological therapy for treating pain. Relaxation training, hypnosis, and exercise may also help. And some antidepressants or anticonvulsants may alleviate pain while treating a psychiatric disorder, but be aware of potential drug interactions. Various psychotherapies can be used on their own or to treat pain in patients with depression or anxiety, or as adjuncts to drug treatment. Pain is demoralizing, as well as hurtful. Cognitive behavioral therapy is not only an established treatment for anxiety and depression, it's also the best studied psychotherapy for treating pain. CBT is based on the premise that thoughts, feelings, and sensations are all related Therapists use CBT to help patients learn coping skills so that they can manage rather than be victimized by their pain. For example, patients might attempt to participate in activities in order to improve function and distract themselves from focusing on the pain. Various techniques can help people to relax and to reduce the stress response, which tends to exacerbate pain as well as symptoms of anxiety and depression. These techniques can include progressive muscle relaxation, yoga, or mindfulness training. Also, during hypnosis, a clinician helps a patient achieve a trance-like state and then provides positive suggestions. For instance, that pain will improve. Some patients also learn self-hypnosis. In one study, investigators asked 204 patients with irritable bowel syndrome to complete self-assessment questionnaires before, immediately after, and up to six years following hypnosis training. They found that 71% of participants reported the technique reduced both gastrointestinal distress and levels of depression and anxiety. Now that's pretty impressive. It says mind over matter. There's also an abundance of research that regular physical activity boosts mood and alleviates anxiety, but less evidence about its impact on pain. And that's absolutely true. Exercise is always relaxing, and it boosts your levels of endorphins, which are feel-good hormones. The Cochrane Collaboration reviewed 34 studies that compared exercise interventions with various control conditions in the treatment of fibromyalgia. The reviewers concluded that aerobic exercise performed at the intensity recommended for maintaining heart and respiratory fitness, which I think is something like 30 minutes three times a week or four times a week. Anyway, that improved overall well-being and physical function in patients with fibromyalgia and might alleviate pain. More limited evidence suggests that exercises designed to build muscle strength, such as lifting weights, might also improve pain, overall functioning, and mood. Now, these things that I've just listed, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, relaxation training, hypnosis, and exercise, these are all things that I would highly recommend to people who are going through a painful experience, whether it be physical or mental, or both. But for those of you that think that those just don't work and maybe you're looking for medications or you're already on medications, uh, that's understandable. I would just suggest trying to go for more natural methods before heading straight for the drugs. But if you are on drugs, just be aware that they can interact in your body and have unintended consequences Many psychiatric drugs and pain medications are metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver, creating the potential for harmful drug interactions. So since they're metabolized by the same enzyme in the same place in your body, sometimes they interact with each other, and even taking two drugs 
that have known listed side effects, they can combine and give rise to effects that you might not expect. And that effect can be amplified with the more drugs that you're taking. So just be wary of that and avoid drugs if possible, but anything that can help you improve your psychological or physical pain, I think is a good thing and and you should try any option you have available to you. So I like that this article brings up that anxiety, depression, and physical pain are actually physically interrelated. Oftentimes I find that If I'm feeling physically unwell, my mental state is less than perfect. And that's something that I think we should all be aware of, is that the way we feel physically does affect the way that we behave and the way that we feel mentally. So for this next part of the show, I want to go on to uh, the three kinds of people that I discussed earlier, just in the way that they handle pain or how they choose not to or how they interact with it and what role it plays in their lives which actually affects their personality and life choices quite a bit so i'm going to start out with the types of people who avoid dealing with their pain they just pretend like it's not there and to help me discuss this, I have an article from marketingforhippies.com titled five ways people avoid dealing with pain Everyone has a shell, some protective mechanisms to keep them out of pain. And when you begin a conversation around new and better possibilities for people, it brings them face-to-face with their current reality. It brings them face-to-face with the quality of life that they are currently settling for. Most people know what is possible, which makes it all the more painful to look at the level that they have decided to live at. Sometimes, depending on the person, the choices that they've made, this will bring up pain for people. So it is important to realize the mechanisms that people have for dealing with pain. In fact, these mechanisms are probably what caused them to settle in the first place. So of the ways that people avoid dealing with pain, there are five listed here. And the first is denial. People try to pretend that it's not there. They pretend that it doesn't hurt. It's like the old Aesop's fable about the fox trying to get the grapes. He tries to trick the crow into dropping them, but when unsuccessful, walks away saying, I didn't want those grapes anyway. I've heard people describe denial by using it as an acronym for Don't Ever Notice I'm Lying. People will go to amazing lengths to pretend that they don't have a problem. Whether it's as extreme as alcoholism, the state of their physical health, or the state of their finances, people seem to believe that if they don't look at the problem, it will simply go away. Denial is the ostrich sticking its head in the sand. You know, this reminds me of somebody I used to know. Uh, We were really good friends for a while, and every time I spent time around her, we would have so much fun, and we'd talk about all of these ideas and it was just a positive uplifting experience but as I got to know her and spent more and more time around her uh, I realized that anytime anything negative came up anything that she didn't like or didn't want to deal with she just waved it off as if it wasn't there didn't matter and this started to become more and more pronounced as time went on because she would make poor life decisions and then just pretend like everything was fine and don't bring it up. Otherwise, she would get really angry. And while a part of me realizes that that's not the way I want to live, I don't want to deny that I have problems, I'm sure I've done it too. Uh, But I also feel somewhat sorry for people like that because... They will never get rid of their problems or overcome them. They will just, you know, find a different path. They'll look for some other option besides dealing with it. And that's not always the ideal option. Anyway, the next way that people avoid pain is through sedatives or numbing out. People can use the sedatives of food, alcohol, or drugs to lower their level of pain. 
The use of any of these once in a while isn't an issue. The issue is that people use these as a consistent pattern, as a crutch. But perhaps the worst drug of all is when people tell themselves, it's okay, don't worry. When people have attempted to create a result again and again and fail, they tend to give up. When people try to handle their finances in countless ways and can't seem to get it together, they'll either step up and take another cut, or they will step down and deal with their pain by saying, It's okay. It's really not that bad. I don't need to deal with it. Sometimes they'll reinforce this by hanging around with a peer group that has equally low expectations of life. This peer group will say things like, Hey, don't be so hard on yourself. Quit working so hard. Relax once in a while. But the peer group is not really saying these things out of any sense of true caring for the person. It's because they don't want to look at the fact that they are also in pain. It's true. Birds of a feather flock together. People can also rationalize and tell themselves stories. You can hear a rationalization a million miles away. They almost always start with the words, Well, it's not like I... Dot, 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 or at least I didn't, followed by one strong standard that they have. They'll say things like, sure, I smoke once in a while, but it's not like I'm one of those people who smokes three packs a day. Or when looking at their finances, they'll say, sure, my finances are a mess, but it's not like I'm $100,000 in debt on credit cards. Or they'll look at their romantic relationships and say, yeah, it's probably not the most fulfilling relationship in the world, but it's not like we're fighting all the time or hate each other. The easiest way to rationalize lowering our standards is to compare ourselves with people who have even lower standards. I agree, you might not have the lowest standards in the world, but that's not something that you should be patting yourself on the back about. I think that there's always room for improvement. You can always have better standards for yourself. Just because there are other people in the world who have bad standards, that doesn't make you uh, an amazing person with no problems. Another way people avoid pain is by justification. They'll give reasons like, I mean, I should do this, but something. And whatever comes after that but is their excuse for not taking action. So at least they acknowledge that there is a problem, but the way they choose to deal with it is to prove to other people in themselves that they can't do anything about it. Now, oftentimes, there's really no good excuse for why you can't do something or why you're not good enough. I mean, look at some of the most successful people in the world. They came from horrible situations. They were poor they had a, a family that moved around a lot or didn't care about them. And they worked their way up to the top. And if they can do that, I don't think that there's any excuse for why people are settling for mediocrity when they could have better for themselves. Sometimes people also use softeners. They'll say things like, I'm big boned versus I'm fat. They say, I'm having a few problems with my finances, as opposed to, my finances are a disaster. People will use the language that softens the emotional impact. And so they'll never even connect with the pain that could actually drive them to create the change they want in their lives. Until people face and ultimately embrace the pain they are currently experiencing, they will never have the energy or motivation to create the level of change that they want. It's like Newspeak from 1984. If you just change the way that something sounds, all of a sudden it has a different psychological impact. I'm sure we've all come across people in life who avoid their problems in one of these ways. And sometimes it's difficult, but if you really care about the person... Maybe in a very understanding way, you could help lead them back to the truth. You know, tell it to them like it is and help them be honest with themselves. You know, you can help them believe that there are more possibilities for themselves, that they can do better. 
that they don't have to keep avoiding their problems. They can just get rid of their problems by accepting them and then working through them. I just find this method of dealing with pain by avoiding it kind of interesting because I don't totally understand it. Like, I know how it functions and what the mechanisms are that people use to avoid pain, but I don't understand why people would choose to live life that way. Because it doesn't seem like it would be fulfilling or easy. If anything, it would, their lives would be made more difficult because there are so many problems building up and they're just pretending that they don't exist. But what happens in those moments of clarity when they do start to think about all of the problems that they have? I, I, I don't know. I just feel, I feel bad for these people. And also, I hope that they, at some point, can start accepting the truth and not avoid problems, but handle them. Conversely, on the other side of the spectrum, there are the people that are known as masochists who enjoy an activity or situation that most people would find very unpleasant. Usually when people hear that word, it applies to, you know, getting sexual pleasure from being hurt or controlled by another person, but that's not the only way that people are masochist. I mean, sometimes people will choose to be in hurtful and damaging relationships. You know, sometimes if you are a person that's in psychological pain, you can be either physically or mentally abusive to other people and get some sort of joy out of that. I don't think anybody believes that that is a good type of relationship. I just think that people who are in abusive relationships such as that, uh, they're just used to it. It's normal for them and they don't really think that they deserve any better or they don't think that they can achieve any better, which both of those things are absolutely false. But some people, you know, they put themselves in situations that are painful just because that's what they know. Sometimes masochism can be something like cutting yourself. I know when I was in high school, I had a lot of friends. Um, this is when I was like 15, 16. I knew some people that for whatever reason, um, they were going through something difficult in life. And they dealt with their pain by taking it out on themselves physically. And I... I really think that that's sad, and I hope that people choose not to do that. But uh, those that do, I think they just they don't know how to handle their pain other than to dig deeper into it, to completely immerse themselves in the pain. And that is a whole other psychological problem in itself. I mean, there are ways to get out of those situations there are ways to deal with that pain and to overcome it. You know, for some people, masochism is a lifestyle choice. And then for other people, masochism is just the way they are or just what they want. And I can't avoid talking about the sexual aspect of masochism because it really is a, a major part of the definition of masochism. And I think it's an interesting psychological phenomena that deserves some acknowledgement because I think it's not that well understood. I have a great article here from Psychology Today titled The Pleasure of Pain, and it explains why one in ten of us is into S&M. Bind my ankles with your white cotton rope so I cannot walk. Bind my wrists so I cannot push you away. Place me on the bed and wrap your rope tighter around my skin so it grips my flesh. Now I know that struggle is useless, that I must lie here and submit to your mouth and tongue and teeth, your hands and words and whims. I exist only as your object, exposed. Of every 10 people who hear these words, one or more has experimented with sadomasochism, which is most popular among educated, middle, and upper middle class men and women, according to psychologists and ethnographers who've studied the phenomena. 
Charles Moser of the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco has researched S&M to learn the motivation behind it. To understand why in the world people would ask to be bound, whipped, and flogged. The reasons are as surprising as they are varied. For James, the desire became apparent when he was a child playing war games. He always hoped to be captured. I was frightened that I was sick, he says. But now, he adds, as a well-seasoned player on the scene, I thank the leather gods I found this community. At first, the scene found him. When he was at a party in college, a professor chose him. She brought him home and tied him up, told him how bad he was for having these desires, even as she fulfilled them. For the first time, he felt what he had only imagined, what he had read about in every S&M book he could find. James, a father and manager, has a type A personality, in control, hardworking, intelligent, demanding. His intensity is evident on his face, in his posture, and in his voice. But when he plays, his eyes drift and a peaceful energy flows through him, as though he's injected heroin. With each addition of pain or restraint, he stiffens slightly, then falls into a deeper calm, a deeper peace, waiting to obey his mistress. Some people have to be tied up to be free, he says. As James's experience illustrates, sadomasochism involves a highly unbalanced power relationship established through role-playing, bondage, and or the infliction of pain. The essential component is not the pain or bondage itself, but rather the knowledge that one person has complete control over the other. Deciding what the person will do, hear, taste, touch, smell, or feel. We hear about men pretending to be little girls, women being bound in a leather corset, people screaming in pain with each strike of a flogger or drip of hot wax. We hear about it because it is happening in bedrooms and dungeons across the country. For over a century, people who engaged in bondage, beatings, and humiliation for sexual pleasure were considered mentally ill. But in the 1980s, the American Psychiatric Association removed S&M as a category in its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This decision, like the decision to remove homosexuality as a category in 1973, was a big step towards the societal acceptance of people whose sexual desires aren't traditional, or vanilla as it's called in S&M circles. What is new is that such desires are increasingly becoming considered normal, even healthy, as experts begin to recognize their potential psychological value. S&M, they're beginning to understand, offers a release of sexual and emotional energy that some people cannot get from traditional sex. The satisfaction gained from S&M is something far more than sex, explains Roy Baumeister, a social psychologist at Case Western Reverse University, it can be a total emotional release. Although people report that they have better-than-usual sex immediately after a scene, the goal of S&M itself is not intercourse. A good scene doesn't always end in orgasm. It ends in catharsis. Sigmund Freud said in 1905, if children at an early age witness sexual intercourse between adults, they inevitably regard the sexual act as a sort of ill-treatment or act of subjugation. They view it, that is, in a sadistic sense. Freud was one of the first to discuss S&M on a psychological level. During the 20 years he explored the topic, his theories crossed each other to create a maze of contradictions. But he maintained that one constant, S&M, was pathological. People became masochistic, Freud said, as a way of regulating their desire to sexually dominate others. The desire to submit, on the other hand, he said, arises from guilt feelings over the desire to dominate. 
He also argued that the desire for S&M can arise on its own when a man wants to assume the passive female role, with bondage and beating signifying being castrated or copulated with, or maybe giving birth. The view that S&M is pathological has thankfully been dismissed by the psychological community. Sexual sadism is a real problem, but it is a different phenomena from S&M. Luke Granger, head of the Department of Psychology at the University of Montreal, created an intensive treatment program for sexual aggressors in La Macaza prison in Quebec. He has also conducted research on the S&M community. They are very separate populations, he says. While S&M is the regulated exchange of power among consensual participants, sexual sadism is the derivation of pleasure from either inflicting pain or completely controlling an unwilling person. Lily Fine, a professional dominatrix who teaches S&M workshops across North America, explains, I may hurt you, but I will not harm you. I will not hit you too hard, take you farther than you want to go, or give you an infection. Despite the research indicating that S&M does no real harm and is not associated with pathology, Freud's successors in psychoanalysis continue to use mental illness overtones when discussing S&M. Sheldon Bach, clinical professor of psychology at New York University and supervising analyst at the U New York Freudian Society, maintains that people are addicted to S&M. They feel compelled to be anally abused or crawl on their knees and lick a boot or a penis or who knows what else. The problem, he continues, is that they can't love. They're searching for love, and S&M is the only way that they can try to find it because they're locked into sadomasochistic interactions they had with parents. Which, I want to jump in and say that that is obviously not true. Just because people enjoy S&M as a healthy part of their sexual life does not mean that they were abused by their parents or that some adult abused them when they were younger. I think that is a very short-sighted and narrow-minded way of looking at this situation. Leanne Custer, an AIDS counselor, was quoted as saying, I can explore aspects of myself that I don't get a chance to explore otherwise. So even though I'm playing a role, I feel more connected with myself. Meredith Reynolds, the Sexuality Research Fellow of the Social Science Research Council, confirms that childhood experiences may shape a person's sexual outlook. Sexuality doesn't just arise at puberty, she says. Like other parts of someone's personality, sexuality develops at birth and takes a developmental course through a person's lifespan. In her work on sexual exploration among children, Reynolds has shown that while childhood experiences can indeed influence adult sexuality, the effects usually wash out as a person gains more sexual experience. But they do linger in some people, causing a connection between childhood memories and adult sexual play. In that case, Reynolds says the childhood experiences have affected something in the personality, and that in turn affects adult experiences. Reynolds' theory helps us develop a greater understanding of the desire to be a whip-bearing mistress or a boot-licking slave. For example, if a child has been taught to feel shame about her body and desires, she may learn to disconnect herself from them. Even as she gets older and gains more experience with sex, her personality may retain some part of that need for separation. S&M play may act as a bridge. Lying naked on a bed bound to the bedposts with leather restraints, she is forced to be completely sexual. The restraint, the futility of the struggle, the pain, the master's words telling her she is such a lovely slave. These cues enable her body to fully connect with her sexual self in a way that has been difficult during traditional sex. Mariana is a prime example. 
She knew from the time she was six years old that she was expected to succeed in school and sports. She learned to focus on achievement as a way to dismiss emotions and desires. I learned very young that desires are dangerous, she said. She heard that message in the behavior of her parents, a depressive mother who let her emotions overtake her, and an obsessively health-conscious father who compulsively controlled his diet. When Mariana began to have sexual desires, her instinct, cultivated by her upbringing, was to consider them too frightening, too dangerous. So I became anorexic, she says. And when you're anorexic, you don't feel desire. All you feel in your body is panic. Mariana didn't feel the desire for S&M until she was an adult and had outgrown her eating disorder. One night, I asked my partner to put his hands around my neck and choke me. I was so surprised when those words came out of my mouth, she says. If she gave her partner total control over her body, she felt that she could allow herself to feel like a completely sexual being, with none of the hesitation and disconnection she sometimes felt during sex. He wasn't into it, but now I'm with someone who is, Mariana says. S&M makes our vanilla sex better, because when we trust each other more sexually, we can communicate what we want. Roy Baumeister said, Like alcohol abuse, binge eating, and meditation, sadomasochism is a way people can forget themselves. It's human nature to try to maximize esteem and control. Those are two general principles governing the study of the self. Masochism runs contrary to both, and was therefore an intriguing psychological puzzle for Baumeister, whose career has focused on the study of self and identity. Through an analysis of S&M-related letters to the sex magazine Variations, Baumeister came to believe that masochism is a set of techniques for helping people temporarily lose their normal identity. He reasoned that the modern Western ego is an incredibly elaborate structure, with our culture placing more demands on the individual self than any other culture in history. Such high demands increase the stress associated with living up to expectations and existing as the person you want to be. That stress makes forgetting who you are an appealing escape, Baumeister says. That is the essence of escape theory, one of the main reasons people turn to S&M. Nothing matters except you, me, and the sound of my voice, Lily Fine tells the tied-up and exposed businessman who begged to be spanked before breakfast. She says it slowly, making her slave wait for every sound, forcing him to focus only on her, to float in anticipation of the sensation she will create inside of him. Anxieties about Mortgages and taxes, stresses about business partners and job deadlines are vanquished each time the flogger hits the flesh. The businessman is reduced to a physical creature existing only in the here and now, feeling the pain and pleasure. I'm interested in manipulating what's in the mind, Lily says. The brain is the greatest erogenous zone. In another S&M scene, Lily tells a woman to take off her clothes, then dresses her only with a blindfold. She commands the woman not to move. Lily then takes a tissue and begins moving it over the woman's body in different patterns and at varying speeds and angles. Sometimes she lets the edge of the tissue just barely brush the woman's stomach and breasts. Sometimes she bunches the tissue and creates swirls on her back, and all the way down. The woman was quivering. She didn't know what I was doing to her, but she was liking it, Lily remembers with a smile. Escape theory is further supported by an idea called frame analysis, developed by the late Irving Goffman. According to Goffman, 
Despite its popular conception as darkly wild and orgiastic, S&M play has complex rules, rituals, roles, and dynamics that create a frame around the experience. Frames suspend reality. They create expectations, norms, and values that set the situation apart from other parts of life, confirms Thomas Weinberg, a sociologist at Buffalo State College in New York and the editor of s and Studies in Dominance and Submission. Once inside the frame, people are free to act and feel in ways they couldn't at other times. S&M has inspired the creation of many psychological theories in addition to the ones discussed here. Do we need so many? Perhaps not. According to Stephanie Saunders, Associate Director of the Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction at Indiana University, a lot of behaviors that are scrutinized because they're seen to be marginal are really a part of the continuum of sexuality and sexual behavior. After all, the ingredients in good S&M play, communication, respect, and trust, are the same ingredients in good traditional sex. The outcome is the same, too, a feeling of connection to the body and the self. Laura Antonou, a writer, puts it another way. When I was a child, I had nothing but S&M fantasies. I punished Barbie for being dirty. I did bondage Barbie, dominance with G.I. Joe. S&M is simply what turns me on. While S&M can be a psychologically healthy activity, its motto is safe, sane, and consensual. Sometimes things do get out of hand. It's rare, but some tops get too involved in power and forget to monitor their treatment of the bottom. I call them natural-born tops, says dominatrix Lily Fine, and I don't have time for them. Also, some bottoms want to be beaten because they have low self-esteem and think they deserve it. They are forlorn, absent, and unresponsive during and after a scene. In this case, S&M ceases to be play and becomes pathological. A small percentage of people inappropriately bring S&M power play into other aspects of their life. Most people in S&M circles are dominant or submissive in very specific situations, while in their everyday life they can play a whole range of roles, says psychology professor Luke Granger. But, he continues, if the only way a person can relate to someone else is through a kind of sadomasochistic game, then there's probably a deeper psychological problem. People often confuse the fact that they feel good after S&M with the idea that S&M can be therapy, says psychology professor Roy Baumeister. But to prove that something is therapeutic, you have to prove that it has lasting beneficial effects on mental health. And it's hard to prove even that therapy is therapeutic. In mental health terms, S&M doesn't make you better and it doesn't make you worse. So I find this whole psychological phenomenon of sadomasochism to be really fascinating. I mean, you might know somebody for a really long time, and you think that you know their personality and all of their likes and dislikes, but they could be playing a completely different role behind closed doors. And to some people, it may seem like a form of escapism, but really, to people who enjoy it, it's a form of ultimate control over your desires. It seems a little contradictory that being in pain can bring someone pleasure, but in these situations, the pain is what makes them realize that they're there in the moment. And this is a nice segue into the final article that I have about why sometimes pain can help us feel more pleasure. So maybe this will help explain the idea of masochism a little bit better. At least it'll help some people to understand why pain can sometimes be enjoyable. 
Now, this article is from theconversation.com. It's titled, In Pursuit of Happiness, Why Some Pain Helps Us Feel Pleasure. The idea that we can achieve happiness by maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain is both intuitive and popular. The truth is, however, very different. Pleasure alone cannot make us happy. Take Christina Onassis, the daughter of shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis. She inherited wealth beyond imagination and spent it on extravagant pleasures in an attempt to alleviate her unhappiness. She died at 37, and in her biography, tellingly subtitled, All the Pain Money Can Buy, recounts a life full of mind-boggling extravagance that contributed to her suffering. Aldous Huxley recognized the possibility that endless pleasure may actually lead to dystopian societies in his 1932 novel, Brave New World. Although the idea of endless pleasure seems idyllic, the reality is often very different. We need pain to provide a contrast for pleasure. Without pain, life becomes dull, boring, and downright undesirable. Like a chocoholic in a chocolate shop, we soon forget what it was that made our desires so desirable in the first place. Emerging evidence suggests that pain may actually enhance the pleasure and happiness we derive from life. Brock Bastian, who's a future fellow at the School of Psychology in Australia, him and his colleagues recently outlined in the journal Personality and Social Psychology Review, Pain promotes pleasure and keeps us connected to the world around us. An excellent example of how pain may enhance pleasure is the experience commonly referred to as the runner's high. After intense physical exertion, runners experience a sense of euphoria that has been linked to the production of opioids, a neural chemical that is also released in response to pain. Other work has shown that experiencing relief from pain not only increases our feelings of happiness, but also reduces our feelings of sadness. Pain may not be a pleasurable experience itself, but it builds our pleasure in ways that pleasure alone simply cannot achieve. Pain may also make us feel more justified in rewarding ourselves with pleasant experiences. Brock Bastian and his colleagues tested this possibility by asking people to hold their hand in a bucket of ice water and then offered them the choice of either a caramello koala or a fluorescent highlighter to take with them as a gift. Participants who did not experience any pain chose the highlighter 74% of the time, but those who had pain only chose it 40% of the time. They were more likely to take the chocolate. Pain, it seems, can make chocolate guilt-free. Pain also connects us to our world. People are constantly seeking new ways to clear their minds and connect with their immediate experiences. Think about the popularity of mindfulness and meditation exercises, both of which aim to bring us in touch with our direct experience of the world. There is good reason to believe pain may be effective in achieving this same goal. Why? Because pain captures our attention. Imagine dropping a large book on your toe mid-conversation. Would you finish the conversation or attend to your toe? Pain drags us into the moment, and after pain, we're more alert and attuned to our sensory environment less caught up in our thoughts about yesterday or tomorrow. Brock and his colleagues also recently tested whether this effect of pain may also have some benefits. They asked people to eat a Tim Tam chocolate biscuit after holding their hand in a bucket of ice-cold water for as long as they could. They found that people who experienced pain before eating the Tim Tam enjoyed it more than those who did not have pain. In two follow-up studies... They showed that pain increased the intensity of a range of different tastes and reduced people's threshold for detecting different flavors. One reason people enjoyed the Tim Tam more after pain was because it actually tasted better. The flavor they experienced was more intense and they were more sensitive to it. 
Our findings shed light on why a Gatorade tastes so much better after a long, hard run, or why a cold beer, or hot tea in my case, is more pleasant after a day of hard labor, and why a hot chocolate is more enjoyable after coming in from the cold. Pain literally brings us in touch with our immediate sensory experience of the world, allowing for the possibility that pleasures can become more pleasant and more intense. Pain also bonds us with others. Anyone who's experienced a significant disaster will know that these events bring people together. Consider the 55,000 volunteers who helped clean up after the 2011 Brisbane floods, or the sense of community spirit that developed in New York in response to 9-11, which actually wasn't just in New York, it's created all over the world, or all over the United States now. Just bring up 9-11. Anyway, painful ceremonies have been used throughout history to create cooperation and cohesion within groups of people. A recent study examining one such ritual, the Kavadi in Meridius, found that participants who experienced pain were more likely to donate money to a community cause as were those who had simply observed the ceremony. The experience of pain, or simply observing others in pain, made people more generous. Building on this work, Brock and his colleagues had people experience pain in groups. Across three studies, participants either immersed their hands in ice water and held a squat position for as long as they could, or ate very hot, raw chilies. They compared these experiences to a no-pain control condition and found pain increased cooperation within the group. After sharing pain, people felt more bonded together and were also more cooperative in an economic game. They were more likely to take personal risks to benefit the group as a whole. Pain is commonly associated with illness, injury, or harm. Often, we don't see pain until it is associated with a problem, and in these cases, pain may have few benefits at all. Yet, we also experience pain in a range of common and healthy activities. Consider the somewhat recent ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. By dosing ourselves in ice water, we were able to raise unprecedented support for a good cause. Understanding that pain can have a range of positive consequences is not only important for better understanding pain, but may also help us manage pain when it does become a problem. Framing pain as a positive rather than negative increases neurochemical responses that help us better manage the pain. So I really enjoy that this article brought up so many ways in which pain helps us to enjoy our everyday lives. It helps us to see how good we have it by providing a contrast for how bad it could be. Relating this back to what I discussed at the beginning of this episode, uh, my illness last week and how much suffering I went through because of that. Once I recovered and got my energy back, I felt so appreciative of the world around me and the people around me and I enjoyed every moment significantly more than I did even before I got sick. And it's not that I don't normally enjoy life, I do. It was just that having the contrast of seeing how terrible my body could feel and then suddenly not having that pain anymore, it made all of the experiences that I normally enjoy that much more pleasurable. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and purposely cause yourself pain unless you are doing something that's, you know, beneficial to you, like exercise. Exercise can certainly be painful. Uh, pulled muscles, brain things, even muscle pain itself when you exercise too much and then your muscles are building up. It can really hurt, and while you're exercising, it can feel grueling. But after you're done, you know, you get that rush of good feelings, like you've just done something that is really good for you. The same goes for 
you know, psychological pain as well. If you're dealing with a problem that seems almost insurmountable and you don't want to face it, you may be pretty miserable. But if you decide to just grin and bear it, you know, and dig into the cause of that pain and find a solution for it, I think just putting up with that little bit of extra pain for a short period of time can have a, an immense positive effect after it's over. And there's really nothing that can beat that feeling of catharsis or that feeling of success. So, if anything, I guess the message that I'm trying to get across is that you shouldn't be afraid to face things that seem difficult or painful or challenging. Don't avoid opportunities just because they might hurt a little bit. Think about what you're going to gain from them. Ultimately, the decision is up to you, but in the end, what do you think will make you a better person? Avoiding the pain? or going through it. Maybe you'll end up getting addicted to it, like some people who get addicted to going to the gym and end up really buff and muscular. Or people who start running and then realize that they love it, and in a few months they're running a marathon. Whatever the situation is, don't be afraid to face the pain, because you'll always be better for it afterwards. That's all I have for you this week. Uh, you can email me your thoughts, comments, and questions at illuminationhour at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next week. What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Illumination Hour. It's me, Ellen, I'm back, and I'm alive, can you believe it? Oh my goodness, I cannot tell you how hard it has been for me to get back in this chair and record with you, because I had to take a sick week last week, unfortunately, and I really didn't want to, but there is a good reason why I did. And I think you'll appreciate it once you find out why. Um, I had this this horrible illness fall upon me, and it lasted only about a week, luckily. But, oh man, it was just debilitating how sick I became. I mean, the first few days it was sore throat, runny nose, and then it turned into a fever where I was just delirious, and I couldn't do anything but sleep for two days. Luckily, I have a wonderful person that I live with that was capable enough to take care of me, and I really sincerely appreciated that. I don't think I would have made it through those two days if it hadn't have been for my wonderful partner. So thank you so much to him, and I'm Excited to say that I've made a full recovery, uh, almost. There's still a few symptoms, but um, I have to say, after going through something so horrible and unpleasant, I've come out of it with a much greater appreciation for the way that I feel on a daily basis. 